okay, Year 12 Global Politics. Today we're going to be looking at the responses taken to the international laws. And the reason why we're talking about responses to the law is because it actually is listed in the blurb of the study design. We aren't just talking about responses to the issue of human rights, but more we, we will need to be able to probably talk about responses to human rights, but also it actually has been listed here that they that responses reflect responses reflect their obligations outlined to the international law. So it is important to not only talk about responses to human rights, but to probably also try to link it to the international law. So that's why it's important to know your articles when it comes to international law. Also, when we're talking about responses, we need to think about the ethical perspective. So are they responding with cosmopolitanism or are they responding with realism? So it might be helpful to go back to the key terms video because it does talk about you know, key terms in relation to um, realism and cosmopolitanism. So in terms of our key knowledge, we need to know responses by relevant global actors, including cosmopolitan and realist perspectives. And we need to be able to evaluate the effectiveness. So, you know, how is this an effective response and how is it an ineffective response? So let's get into our first international law, and that is with CEDAW and Australia. So Australia has been quite effective in upholding the obligations under CEDAW. Um, we have included sex discrimination in state and local governments within Australia. Um, in Victoria, we have the Equal Opportunity Act. And in the Equal Opportunity Act, there's Article 6, which includes that discrimination against all areas of sex. And so that actually aligns with CEDAW with Article 3. So, you know, we are then therefore upholding the, the rights in here. Um, so we have effectively complied with CEDAW. In Australia at the moment, there, there has been in a, a national conversation concerning rights of women um, due to the gender pay gap, increased domestic violence and violent attacks in public places. You know, and this year there has been a lot of discussion even in Parliament regarding the conduct of parliamentarians and you know staffers in parliament when you know we heard very early on in the year um, about the, involving um, Brittany Higgins so there has been an increased conversation about women's rights in Australia um, in 2018 the CEDAW committee met with a number of officials within Australia and within the review, they provided Australia with 90 recommendations to improve its record on women's rights and gender discrimination. Um, as far as I know, there weren't, the recommendations haven't actually been fulfilled. Um, so that could be something to talk about. Um, so, you know, it does show that Australia has been somewhat effective um, and that, you know, justice may not be really achieved here for women because you know, there, there are still some gaps. And despite CEDAW trying to actually, um, the committee trying to actually encourage change, there actually hasn't been anything done about it. So let's move on to CEDAW in the US. Now the CEDAW of the US is quite an interesting area because they haven't ratified the, the law. Um, and this is because they, they value their sovereignty over, you know, their sovereignty and their ability to make laws in, in what is their preferences over moral obligations to the international community. So they haven't actually ratified. And so this has allowed them, the US, to actually make laws that contravene provisions of CEDAW. So, for example, in the US, women don't have paid maternity leave and they don't have social services, comparable social services. And there's been budget cuts since 2017 in areas like Planned Parenthood, which um, has been under regular attacks by the Republicans. So, you know, 
in these, because of these things, and you know the fact that they don't have um, paid maternity leave, that's illegal under Article Eleven of CEDAW. You know it says that women should receive paid leave, and so what America is doing does contradict the CEDAW laws and their failure to ratify actually also undermines CEDAW. Um, Human Rights Watch have also called the discrimination within America as discrimination on a national level. So it's something that is being criticised you know, internationally and is looked upon as something very, very poor. In 2020, the Supreme Court of the USA upheld a decision that allowed employers to not include contraceptives in healthcare based on the employee, the employer's um, religious or moral grounds, which means that your workplace can decide whether or not you can have access to the pill. So it's a very controversial area um, and obviously is allowing the bodies of women to be you know, to have laws made in this area for women. Um, more recently, so this is something we haven't, we didn't get a chance to talk about in class, but the, in Texas, the Heartbeat Act came into effect in September, 2021. So this law meant that women weren't able to have an abortion after six weeks. And after that, there are severe consequences for it. And so that would obviously violate article, violates one of the articles of, I think maybe it was article six, but, you know, it does violate one of the articles within, um, within CEDAW. Also, there's been over 500 restrictions made to abortions since the start of 2021. Um, the Biden administration has tried to undermine these you know, these restrictions and has tried to make executive actions that would remove what Trump has put in place. Um, but, you know, the fact that in Texas this year, they were able to still pass this law, it does show that, you know, the US is far behind what the international community are doing and are still discriminating against women. You know, these laws have been described by Camilla Harris as a scene from The Handmaiden's Tale. You know, that women here are being severely discriminated against and it is really weakening CEDAW, the fact that, you know, this democracy, this, the uh, world leader such as the US is still having laws like this is, is very concerning. So that's the US. They've obviously done a, a poor effort here because they have actually violated the conventions of CEDAW and have also refused to, to ratify. We have Saudi Arabia. Now, this is an interesting area of an interesting um, example to look at because they have signed and ratified CEDAW. So they do obviously believe that women should be discriminated against. However, as we've talked about in the last video about um, human rights that and about CEDAW is that there can be reservations, which means that states will say that they don't want to follow certain parts of it. And there is a general reservation with CEDAW that the kingdom is under no obligation to observe any, sorry, the contradictory terms of the convention. So basically here, because of the their strict following of Sharia law, they believe that women they, you know, they, they, they have, uh, have basically said that they are going to allow restrictions and they are going to allow, you know, women to be discriminated against if it violates their cultural beliefs. And that is because of Sharia law. Now, within Sharia law, there is a, they have a male guardianship system, which means that Every Saudi woman has a male guardian and they have the power to make decisions on their behalf. So that means that when Saudi Arabia is making laws and, you know, if they are discriminating against women, they will say, well, this is because of Sharia law. And, you know, 
because we have this male guardianship system, it does mean that we can make decisions about women. So they have been criticised for this. In 2018, um, the committee, the committee, the CEDAW said that Sharia law is not enough of a reason to violate the rights of women. So they said, you know, while noting that the state's party legislation is derived from Sharia, the committee considers that diversity, opinion, and sure, um, judicial concepts exist within the Muslim jurisdiction to enable legislative reform and address discriminatory provisions. So basically they were saying, you know, your reservation that, you know, you aren't gonna make laws that violate Sharia law, that's not an acceptable excuse. So after 2018, and after this kind of visit, the Crown Prince introduced new social reforms. And these reforms included women being able to drive alone, women being able to get a passport, um, travel alone, um, go without their male guardians, register a birth, marriage or divorce. And now in 2021, women can live by themselves. So these were massive steps in the right direction. You know, these are you know, allowing women to have less discrimination here. So that's good. However, in 2020, women still can't marry, which violates Article 16. Um, they can't leave a prison or a domestic shelter without their consent of their male guardians. So there are still contra they are still contravening some of the articles. Um, and, you know, so there, and there are still restrictions on the way women can dress, their interactions with males who aren't in their family, restrictions on sport. So because of this strict interpretation of, of Sharia law, it does mean that women and men are still not equal despite these these reforms, you know, there are still circumstances when women aren't being treated the same as men. So that's CEDAW. Let's get into the Convention Against Torture. So with the Convention of Torture, um, China has signed and ratified um, the Convention in 1988. However, since 2017, China has been carrying out attacks and abuses against Muslims living in Xinjiang under the guise of terrorism. So there's a clear intention by China to target these, this particular ethnic group. They are trying to root out Islamic religious beliefs and cultural practices. They're trying to assimilate the population. Um, and, you know, currently there are close to a million people or maybe over a million people being held in these re-education camps. So this year in June 2021, Amnesty International published a report based on the first-hand testimonies of these former detainees. So in, these, in this report, it said that these people were being indoctrinated and were suffering from physical and psychological torture. They had loss of control and autonomy, which was likely to cause mental and physical suffering, which was all enough to constitute violating Article 1 of the Convention of Torture. Based on these findings, they have violated the definition of torture because they are conducting torture. Um, also, there's been, um, during interrogations, there's been punishments such as beatings, electric shocks, the tiger chair, chair, stress positions, sleep deprivation, all forms of torture, which violates Article 1 and Article 2. And also they've been using these interrogations to gain confessions, which does violate Article 15. So overall, China has breached and broken the what's been actually said in the Convention of Torture. Clearly, Article 1, Article 2, and Article 15. The committee have investigated this. However, there has been no further action taken.
Okay, we also have here North Korea. Um, the, in 2014, the UNHCR on Human Rights looked into, well, they delivered a report which outlined a system of torture, inhumane and degrading treatment inside North Korea. They had testimony from survivors of torture who escaped by fleeing. The torture, well, sorry, the, the stories included infanticide, forced abortion, executions, beatings, shacklings. So there was a number of circumstances of torture being said in, the, in this report. However, following this report, um, the capital responded and said that these findings were fabricated and survivors who testified were human scum and terrorists disloyal to the regime. So this, you know, despite having this report out there, there's actually no enforcement mechanism. You know, the Convention Against Torture haven't been able to actually hold the state of North Korea accountable, meaning that there's no punishment for North Korea and therefore there's no justice for the victims of torture. Um, also following this report, the General Assembly voted that the Security Council refers North Korea to the International Criminal Court for investigation. However, as North Korea are not a party to the Rome Statute, they can't be investigated by the ICC. And, you know, so the, the UN Security Council have to make an official referral to The Hague. And the UN Security Council are yet to do this. They are yet to make any um, report and, you know, you know, do a vote on this. So really, overall, there is a lack of justice here for the victims of, the tor of torture in North Korea. And, you know, North Korea obviously don't care what the international community says about them or when there is international condemnation for when they breach these things. So it does show that international laws and conventions are only as powerful as the willingness of states to sign on and ratify these laws. Okay, um, with the Convention of Torture, we have in laws within Australia, we actually have got laws in place that, in domestic laws that link up to Article, Article 1 of the Convention Against Torture. However, we have been accused of violating the Convention Against Torture by detaining children in immigration detention centres and holding asylum seekers in dangerous and violent conditions on that island. So the, well, I guess the special rapporteur on torture has investigated allegations of torture presented to them in the UN Hum Human Rights Council. In their report, it said that Operation Sovereign Borders violates the Convention Against Torture as it allows arbitrary detention and refugee determination at sea without access to lawyers. Also in that report, it said that because we, of the poor conditions for children in detention um, and the fact that asylum seekers are being, you know, in these conditions that are inhumane or degrading, that we are then torturing these people. Um, in 2019, the Human Rights Commission reported on the use of force in immigration detention and it said that these conditions were harsh, restrictive and prison-like with high security count compounds. Um, also, the fact that we you know, transfer people between places does compound people's anxiety and insecurity and therefore is torturing them. Um, the Subcommittee on the Prevention of Torture also visited six countries to inspect places of torture and Australia and Nauru were looked into that. Um, this was something that we looked at last year in year 11, but it could be interesting to look at, um, to look at Dondale detention center because that's also maybe being considered as part of torture, you know, children being held in detention as well. Okay, our last global actor to look at, this is more, with Amnesty International, they don't obviously sign an international law, but what they can do is encourage states to actually 
take action and do something about torture. So Amnesty International will report, campaign and lobby against states to ensure that they do um, comply with the Convention Against Torture. According to Amnesty International, states have failed to criminalise torture as a specific offence under national laws. And, you know, there are countries around the world that are continuing to torture people. And they have received, you know, between 2009 and 2013, 141 countries will have re received reports of torture from 141 countries. So that's, that's extraordinary. That's a large number of countries that are still using torture. Um, Amnesty International also do checks in detention centres and monitoring of investigations. So, you know, they, they are there to witness and make sure that people aren't being tortured. Um, and as we saw with the Convention Against Torture, in the optional protocol, there is a chance for states to have an independent body to investigate torture and this would be Amnesty International. So they were actually successful in stopping and ending, ending torture. Um, and this was in their Stop Torture campaign where over 800,000 people wrote to the Delta State Governor, so in Nigeria. So there were thousands of letters written in support of Moses. Um, Moses was, um, accused of armed robbery and he was held in detention and in that time he was tortured beaten and you know um they, they used machetes and all sorts of awful things against him however the in amnesty international started a letter writing campaign and as a result of all these letters he was pardoned and his death sentence was commuted so it was it is a success of an organisation to uphold human rights and also to prevent torture from taking place. And Amnesty International play an important role because they are encouraging states to do the right thing. So we've now covered a number of different responses to human rights and um, we have looked at now how they actually uphold the con Convention Against Torture and um, elimination of discrimination against women. I hope that was helpful for you um, and thank you for listening.